Hello, good morning. I'm Adrian Ryan from ARP, and um, we, we provided the civil structural engineering and facade engineering on the project. Now, Michael and Liam have just done a fantastic job about setting up what the project is, the, the, the building, and the framework in which we work. So, I suppose that the folks in my case study will be a little bit more on just a couple of civil and structural nuggets from the case study of how we delivered this building, and, and hopefully, some things we learned, some challenges we see, and uh, points for discussion because I think this is one of the first really major complex projects that is being delivered and, and we're not at the end yet as, as Liam has shown, we're in construction so um, this is an area I'm not a BIM practitioner, I'm a project manager who delivers projects so I come at this very much from how do I deliver the job and how, where does BIM help me and where does it make my job more difficult as I work through this. So that's kind of my perspective that, that, that hopefully comes across. Um, so, a couple of things I'm going to touch on as we work through. So, it's why are we doing this, how are we doing this, and then maybe some challenges and questions towards the end so we can check back in on this as we go. Just very briefly on, on Arup, we are a large multinational design firm um, in 35 countries. In Ireland, we're quite big, over 550 people. So, what that says to, to me is that from what we heard from Barry earlier on, we're, we're a big beast in consultancy in Ireland. And if we learn anything from um, evolutionary history and disruptive technologies, we're the kind of big beast who dies if we don't keep up with the technological change and the innovation. So we're very conscious of that, and we've really embraced trying to make BIM our business as usual. So in all of our significant design projects, BIM is the way we set ourselves up, and we attack these projects now. And um, you know, that's the why for us. What's the why for Trinity and the client, and independently, I think Michael and I arrived at the same, the same graph. This is about integrating better, collaborating better, visualizing early and putting our design requirements together better and earlier. How the cost of doing that exercise when a thing is on site and there's hundreds of people on a site trying to build a thing and against the type program, is, is, that's an extremely expensive time to make a change and that's borne out in these graphs. So you're trying to pull that forward into the design process. That you can pull that work forward into a design process and reduce your design time and reduce your fees, I think is, is, is a very big wish list and I don't think it's the place you can start. So if you, as Liam says, as you try and pull all that coordination forward into the design process, there has to be realization that there is a cost less than doing it on site and a time, a time element to get that work done. Um, that's one of it. The other that it is hard to pull forward for us as designers is statutory. So the fire department, the planning process, all of these processes are out of our hands and they, they do create changes in our designs so that we have to be conscious of. So, so back to the case study. Um, firstly, just starting off how we set ourselves up to, to, to tackle this as a BIM project from the outset. And um, if there's one thing I've learned from, from a number of projects, the critical thing is that everybody has the same building in the same place, in the same orientation on their models. It sounds incredibly simple and is actually quite difficult. So how we set ourselves up to do that from the outset for the business school was our point cloud that Liam has touched on. Um, the point cloud of itself gives you great context of where it is and a huge body of information. But if you don't use that information beyond that, you've missed an opportunity and you're not trying to release some of the benefit because it does cost more to get this point cloud for the client. It does take longer to take this huge body of information and resolve it into the Revit model you see in the bottom right hand corner, which actually takes thousands of points and tries to come up with surfaces and, and things that we can integrate into our models. So some of the ways in the civil structural side we've used that model is, for example, in our demolition and enabling works. We very much relied on the model to come up with comprehensive and clear information for a builder to say, this is what needs to be demolished, this is what needs to come out. And that can be both in terms of visualization, in terms of us not missing things, the builder not missing things, and documentation in that you're not drawing things from scratch, you're not pulling them across and redrafting and redrawing, you're actually trying to build on the information that you draw from the supply chain, that you draw from other BIM elements of the model. So that's, that's one sample there. Another, in a complex project like the business school where we have demolition and enabling works contract and then a follow-on main contract, is it's very important to try and define where one ends and where another begins. So for something as simple as where the earth profile will be at the end of the job, in Civil 3D we were able to model where we felt when the foundations were scrubbed up and the, 
and the uh, services were taken out, what was the target end of site condition for one contract? And then by having that staged and integral in your model, you can both use it as an end to your first stage of works and the start to your next stage of work in a very fluid way and in a very clear way across your design information. So again, the detail here is, uh, is not to be seen, but it's more that it's always from the model, it's always from the single source that you're drawing the same information. And that's been one of the benefits for us. Um, <clears throat> one of the particular challenges here in the protected structure of six Georgian buildings, there is an implied accuracy about a model, whether you like it or not. If you model joists at centers and you model those bearing on steelwork, and you model them as timber grade, C16 or C18, you're, you're implying an accuracy, you're implying you know what was going on there. Uh, none of us were born in Krypton, so we can't see through floors or walls or anything else. So a, a normal opening up works gives you a certain amount of knowledge. So for something like the protected structures, I think they've long been a challenge in the, in the government form of works contract, and there are investigation and works contracts more suited to that. When you try and integrate these buildings into something like the business school, we have gone back and used CAD where we open up in certain areas, we learn something, we develop suites of typical details such as the bottom right hand corner of what if the joist is rotten, what if it bears on steel, what if it's in good condition, so we can develop matrix of details and instead of trying to model in all of these, we, we let a competent builder who, who understands building and understands protected structures, we give them the information they need using 2D information in, in the case of these protected structures. Um, that can still sit in the BIM world and the BIM process once we locate it properly, once we name it properly, once we use the, the data environments such as ASI in our case to share it properly. So just because a particular, as a designer's choice, a particular element of a project you decide is best tackled in a 2D format or a different pen and paper format doesn't mean you can't still build that back into the BIM process so that it's not an outlier or, or, or off the edge. Um, so, so that's worked reasonably well, I think, on, on the business school project, and Celine can comment on that if I'm telling a lie. Um, so that's the first element. Moving on a little bit to the civil infrastructure. Again, there's a criminal amount of work in that little graphic. <laughs> Hundreds of hours of design, integration, over and back with the architect, other designers, the MEP, where can this manhole be? Where can that manhole be? There's just, it doesn't bear thinking about how much information is held in that. Um, and it can often be the challenge that if I was a client and I saw that, I would have thought that the intern knocked it together in two or three days. It's not the case, but the people in this room know it takes a lot longer. Um, it's naive to think that the person down on site, the, the, the average uh, earthworks contractor charged with putting in this infrastructure is going to work off that little model. They possibly can and they're getting there, but more likely is they're going to work off a detailed set of construction drawings, which still need to be derived and still need to be presented. This is important for our contract sets. It's important for the wet Friday afternoon person down the hole trying to decide what the invert level on the manhole is. Their iPad may not be working. They may not have access to uh, that information, which is changing, but it will change slowly and it will change faster in certain parts of the industry than others. Um, one of the real strengths, again, thinking about demolition and enabling and a main contract was that when you work with contractors like BAM and JJ Radkins, um, who are getting into that space where they deliver as-built BIM drawings, means that we get as-built 3D data back from the contractor. This, in, in this case, it was a BAM as-built. They were at that stage, which allows us, again, to re-enter the Navis cycle to check our main works against the as-built civils and, and find some clashes and with, with Radkins and very uh, interactive and fluid there to, to, to spot any challenges from, from what had been built and handed over. So, so that's just showing in civil infrastructure that it, it, it's not, there's no end in this. It, it starts at the very start of putting your design decisions down and documenting it and getting as-built information back and then moving on to the next stages. And I'm sure this slide in, in a year or two's time will have the next set of as-builts and, and detailing with, with, with Radigans as our main contract works. Um, Modeling the main building structure, I guess, I'm mindful that it's, again, it's an experienced room. I don't want to get into, we did this, that, and the other. I think people are aware that using a tool like Revit, 
the main thing is to understand the level of model definition like like Liam has spoken about and to actually put the work in to, to, to build the key elements of your structure into the model and share that frequently and consistently with others so that they can coordinate it with their design. The end product is usually quite impressive but uh, it takes a lot of work to get there. So just looking at some of the components, that, that, that's the 18 meter transfer beams that, that take five stories across our main auditorium in the business school. There is one very key connection here where um, that steelwork meets a steel column which then coordinates down into concrete. So we had to put a lot of thought into how all of that comes together and model it as such. There was value in modeling that for us. The deliverable from same was a detailed drawing that could have been developed from CAD or any, any other number of ways. But again, the point here is if, if somebody in um, a contracting body goes into our model, they will see all of that connection detail modeled. But it will, that's the level of information it will have. They will spend all day clicking to find what's this weld, what's that bolt. The drawing is still a hugely useful tool in communicating how we build buildings and present designs. Similarly, the, I mean, just the level of detail, the, the, the visualization of what things are. You could draw any number of plans and sections to describe that vault as built on the left, as constructed on the right, but the, the model really tells you very quickly what it is and things that are important to us, like health and safety, you can quite quickly describe that that structure is not complete until the two levels of walls are done. So, so the, the power of visualization and, and communication using our models is, is really something that wasn't there 10 years ago. Um, level of detail. I remember going to a talk by Gary Anderson in Jordan. He, he talks about how he used to draw a wishbone suspension for the Jordan car in three hours and now it took three weeks. Uh, similarly here, we could have drawn a timber cross section for this raking lecture theatre in about a half an hour. Um, as it happened, we modelled it because we were, up, we were in a place where we thought to coordinate the, the air system for this lecture theatre. We needed to have that level of information. In hindsight, I'm not so sure. So sometimes you misstep. I think we can over model. And then um, yesterday's bonus becomes today's entitlement. And, and what, what I mean by that is that you have contractors who will feel that if I gave a standard detail through one of those steps that I haven't actually lived up to my, my level of model definition. I haven't given them the, the information they need to go ahead and build this thing. And, and that's where you need to stop perhaps and have the common sense discussion of, well, you know it's four joists equally spaced across the lecture theater step. Is there adequate information there? Is the design complete? I'd say yes. Is, does the model need to be complete for the design to be complete? I think no, and I, I think we can, as Liam has spent a bit of time talking about, I think we need to stop and pause and think, when will a standard detail be adequate to describe a detail that repeats thousands of times in a big building? And it's, I think we need to spend a lot of time in collaboration, trying to agree what's sensible and what just makes a model unworkable or overly large or doing it because we can. Um, so I think the clash resolution Liam talked about and their process was very much, this is the kind of sheet we got which, which presented the issues pulled from a graphic with an action and a, and a complete and it takes a huge amount of work to get these models to come together but you know they really can um, and, and what you get at the end of them is highly detailed. They look, um, they look quite simple, but simple takes a lot of work to achieve. And again, just coming back to the, the point on drawings, um, for me, a federated model is a bit like the globe. I can find where Nairobi is on it, but sometimes you need a set of directions saying, this is how you get to Dublin Airport. These are the airlines that fly to Nairobi. This is the person, the taxi man that will collect you when you arrive. So we actually embed as designers a lot of direction and discussion and how we got there and what to look out for in our drawings that if a person on site is very focused on just the model and the and technology is getting to a place where a lot of site engineers are focusing on the model, they're just going to the model for information, you can lose a lot of the information that we naturally build into our drawing sheets to describe how things are envisaged where movement joints might be or construction sequencing and these kind of important information so uh, it takes quite a bit of work to to bring the, both of those items on together just to, i suppose to sum up um, 
some of the opportunities, challenges and lessons on this job. One of the unmeasured benefits is definitely visualization. Uh, I think we spend well over a year with this project. We know the building inside out. Contractors expect it to come in and hit the ground and start building straight away. So by, by using the model and allowing to present the floors, we can very quickly, and for our clients as well, we can very quickly describe the building that we've come up with. Um, supply chain capability, some industries such as steelwork, they, get, they reap huge benefits of reaching that extra level of development because they use it in their uh, manufacture process. Other parts of the industry less so. So the pilers, person driving a piling rig wants a set out a circle with a coordinates in the center of it. That's what they need. The benefit to that industry of a 3D model of the whole piling solution is less so and that makes it harder to get back. Um, and that's the reality as you get down into different systems. The, the key challenges, I suppose, is scale and appropriate source of information. So again, going into the model and not working through the drawings, I think, will continue to be a problem. Scale on a drawing, one is 500, it tells you more than just that that's the scale of the drawing. It says that this drawing is about a visualization from a certain distance. Scale of one in 10 is trying to tell you that this is a, a highly detailed piece of information. So the scale tells you more than just what you, piece of the ruler to use, it tells you the, the, the granularity of the detail that's trying to be communicated. Um, subjectivity in the assessment of the LOD, yes, I think we've been through that. I was amazed to think that when we were drawing with CAD, you had to potentially deliver a CAD file in the PDF, and now that you're doing a model, you, you can be delivering a CAD file, a PDF, an IFC, a DWG, NWC, NWD, DWXF. The amount of files that you're expected to give over because you've created more information it's quite astounding and a bit counterintuitive. I think the industry needs to sharpen up here a bit so that we, we're, we're managing less files, not more, because of creating a model. Um, Liam has gone through the conflict between this concept of giving away the model, but the, the, you know, the client's right to make changes through a building and expecting their design team to do it. Um, change happens, errors happen and who owns the model and authorship is tough and it needs to be resolved and it will be resolved, I'm sure. Um, the, the little graphic on the bottom, again, it picks up the point that it, our contractors get us value by going to the market, by finding different answers for different things and they have the right to do so, but if, if the AHU, if the Acme AHU has the air inlet on the left and the Fisher-Price one has the air inlet on the right and that has a consequence for all of the coordinated builders' work, and the reinforcement detail is done from the coordinated model, there is a disconnect between the workflow of when you can have the information to complete the structural model that you're supposed to have handed over at tender. So people working in the market will be familiar with those challenges and I think it's going to take some time to tease that out and get those two to coalesce together as well as we can. Um, again, not to repeat the point, um, I suppose if you're building 100,000 cars, there's great merit in modeling it to the nth degree, every part of it, every detail, because you get the value of that and repeat, 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 repeat. Every building is a one-off, it's a special, it's a prototype. And the, 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 the idea that it's worthwhile to develop a model that has absolutely everything in it in the one place is unreasonable, but, but only as designers experienced designers push back and describe and guide the industry on how we can actually provide all the information in a sensible way in the BIM process. Do we get the, um, the full value of this? Uh, so to finish, I think BIM can be improved as designers and clients tighten up on the information that we actually want at the end. That's that's a must. Or us ourselves as designers, we need to get better at just using this model that we create to, to live with our design so that we can parametrically react to change a lot quicker. Single source of truth, I would absolutely concur with, and we're all working towards that. And, and the future is bright for this. I mean, um, contractors tracking progress, RFIs, health and safety, all, as all of this starts to live and be hosted in the model, I think we're, we're just, it's going to become business as usual and really going to reap great benefits from, from entering this process. So that's it. Thank you very much.